folks, Brian Havens here back at the lathe. Uh, I thought I'd pick up where we left off with uh, face work technique. Uh, last time we looked at uh, cutting a crossed end grain. Uh, and this time take a look at uh, how to deal with the other kind of grain that we find in face work, which is side grain. Now, the good news with side grain, unlike cutting a cross end grain, is that it's not, although you can get a catch and bad things can happen, it's generally more frustrating and unnerving than it is dangerous. Um, that is because, as we saw when we took a, looked at uh, cutting a cross end grain, that side grain actually yields quite readily to the, um, um, to the, to the cutting tool. Now, to a cutting edge. Now, um, that doesn't mean that if you try hard enough, you can get a really nasty catch. If I were to take this gouge and just shove it in there, I could get a leverage catch, just like I get on end grain. But more than likely, it's just going to make a big gash in the wood. Now, side grain, when you're doing face work, means that we're talking about this flat surface here that's perpendicular to the lathe bed. So, my wood fibers right now are situated like this. So, I'm cutting across these wood fibers, um, at some, sometimes I'm cutting perpendicularly across them, sometimes I'm actually cutting long grain for a moment, and a lot of the time I'm cutting diagonally across uh, the fibers. And there's a couple of things that can go wrong uh, when you're dealing with side grain like this. Probably the biggest mistake that people make is to come in, especially with a, sh um, a shallow gouge, with the flute straight up in the air, fully open, and trying to cut on the wing. And what can happen, I can show you in slow motion here, as you bring the tool in, you might get away with it for a while if you're using a, bare, a white knuckle grip, but eventually what happens is that tool is it ends up catching and leaving a big gash in, uh, in your work. So what happened there? Well, while the flute is up on the tool rest, the support is right in the center of the tool. And, but since I'm cutting, trying to cut on this wing, uh, the downward force of the wood against the uh, cutting edge wants to roll this over. And because I'm not unbalanced, my fulcrum is over here, I'm trying to cut, my fulcrum is right here, and I'm trying to cut over here, um, I have to hold on to the tool really tightly in order to keep it from falling over. Now, you could probably cut that way if you want to keep a white knuckle grip all the time. But I find if you, when you turn that way, at some point you're going to let loose a little bit and the wood's not going to forget and it's going to knock that tool right over. Um, the other thing is, if you're, t if you're turning with a, with, a, with a white knuckle grip all the time, it gets tiring to turn that, after, uh, turn that way after a while. And it also makes it very hard to make really precise and clean cuts that way because you're focusing on controlling the tool as opposed to controlling your cut. Now, the reason it gets even worse is because as the tool wants to rotate counterclockwise, if you imagine the perimeter of a clock, if you're moving from 12 o'clock to 9 o'clock, you're actually, one way to look at it is that you're rotating, the other way to look at it is you're going down to the left. And because this tool, as it, the tool, as it, as it gets its catch, the edge wants to go further into the tool, so it actually digs in. <clears throat> the other thing that can happen uh, when you're cutting face grain is because the force has there's some centrifugal force involved. Whenever you're cutting, the the wood tends to want to throw the tool outwards. So when you're trying to, if you're cutting from center out, you have to be aware of that. You may get ahead of yourself. This cut may get ahead of you um, because the out the Cyclical force is trying to throw the tool to the outside. It's usually, you can go both ways, but usually it's easier to go from outside in because you're fighting the forces. If you're a regular wood turner and you've done routing, it's similar between the difference between doing regular routing and back routing. Not as, not as serious as that. Back routing is much more risky than this. But there is that force that when you're trying to cut in the direction with the force, you have to exercise extra control. I had a lot of trouble with a side grain for a long time because I would try to use that same cross grain cut that works so well against end grain, uh, cross end grain, and I would just try to use that same cut uh, on face grain, I mean, uh, yeah, sorry, on side grain. So what I would do is I would try to enter in the cut just like when you're cutting across end grain, 
up and up the back flute. And you can feel, you can hear that, it's a, it's not, it's kind of a crude cut. It's not nice and smooth. And the other thing you can see, it actually leaves a lot of tear out in the fibers. Let's take a look, let's get a camera picture of that. Now one, we might try to make a lighter cut. Let's see if that works. And that helped a little bit, but I still have tear out, even with a, even with a lighter pass. So what's going wrong? Why does this cut work so well when cutting across end grain, but as soon as you try to use it you know, for side grain, it starts tearing up the fibers? What happens is that cut that was working so well cutting across end grain. Uh, it was cutting, the tip was cutting across the fibers and then that little bit, that little end up, that little bit at the end that got sliced away was just hanging on there and the uh, wing would, would, would um, scrape that away. And what happens when you start to do the same thing on face grain is that that tip that's trying to slice through the fibers is actually getting underneath the fiber uh, and then the wing uh, will tear it away from the surface, it'll pry it away. So it's basically ripping the fiber off the surface. That's why we're getting these bits of uh, tear out in, in, the, in the grain. So if we can't cut um, with the tip of the gouge and peel away with the wing, then how are we gonna cut this uh, side grain? Well, there's a, it took me a long time to figure this out, but there's another situation where you're cutting uh, side grain as well. And uh, when you're doing spindle work, most uh, general spindle work, I've got the fiber running across this way and uh, I'm either cutting uh, perpendicular to the work or I'm cutting at about a 45 to try to get a nicer cut. Uh, and I'm cutting pretty much the, the direction of the fiber is always perpendicular uh, or the, the fibers are always parallel to the lathe bed and it's always coming directly towards my tool. But it's still side grain just like it is here whereas here in face grain, in, in uh, side grain and face work, it's almost the same. I'm hitting the fibers perpendicular uh, at one point, and at other points I'm cutting through the fiber uh, diagonally. But what I find is that with bevel rubbing cuts, that subtlety doesn't change anything. So it turns out that all of the cuts that work well when cutting across side grain and spindle work also work well. Uh, and face work. So basically the idea uh, where you've got the work spinning, you put the tool in the tool rest, you rub the bevel, and you raise the handle until the cutting edge engages, either perpendicular to the lathe bed or you can try to uh, cut the fibers at more like a 45 degree in either direction um, to get a better cut. So we can use those same cuts that work so well in spindle turning to cut side grain, uh, to cut side grain uh, during and face work. And so I'm going to do exactly the same thing. So I'm going to do this cut just the same way as I would do this on spindle turning. So I have a tool and tool rest. I rub the bevel and I raise the hand mill until I start until it starts to cut. And you can see how much more pleasant of a cut it is. But I'm not trying to go head on into that uh, end grain anymore. I can also do it at about a, uh, more than a 45 degree angle. And you can see those corkscrew kind of shavings that come off uh, when you know you're cutting, getting a nice cut. Now let's take a look at the surface.
much more smooth. There's, you can see some tiny bits of um, uh, tool marks in there, but I would much rather deal with tool marks. They send out nicely uh, as opposed to having to deal with um, tear out because with tear out, you're actually going to have to cut, you're actually going to have to sand all the material around <clears throat> from around the tear uh, from around the tear out because tear out's actually underneath the surface, whereas tool marks are superficial. They send out pretty easily. Now, um, you can do this cut in both directions, but you have to be careful of two. Th uh, there has to be careful of the strickle force. So I can start in the middle. and come out, so you can see. You can go out uh, both ways with this, but as you can see, sometimes that tool wants to get thrown out. So it's a lot harder to get that good control coming outwards. Now, the other thing you have to be careful of, I come in from the end here a lot. But if you're a beginner, you might not want to do that because there's, the, there's, a, there's a possibility that I'm going to catch the end grain side of this instead, and you're going to get a catch in end grain. Um, so if you're experienced and you're careful, you can come in from the end. But um, if you're not comfortable with doing that, there's a couple of other ways you can go about it. I can come start inside the edge, come out, and then pick up my cut and come back in. Or I can scrape with the wing of the gouge off the end and then turn around and pick up the cut inside the edge. Now the other subtle difference to notice uh, with um, between cutting uh, side grain and, and face work and with spindle work is that when I'm cutting uh, in spindle work, um, the cutting direction is coming up and around the work, so it's always coming straight towards me. Um, so it doesn't matter if I lower the tool rest and I cut a little bit lower, or I raise the tool rest and cut a little bit higher, it's all a question of my tool handle height and what's comfortable for me. Um, but with, uh, with side grain on uh, face work, my cutting direction is actually in a circle. So if I'm cutting it exactly 90 degrees uh, at, at the 9 o'clock, then my cutting direction is actually straight down. And so I could lower my tool rest and try to cut here. But there's a couple of problems. One, uh, it, if you're cutting at about a 45, you might be able to do it, but the tool, uh, the, the, the lathe bed tends to get in the way. Um, but it turns out, well, the way I usually make the cut is if I cut around 10 o'clock, 9 30, 10 o'clock, now if my tool swings out away from the, the lathe bed, uh, and my cutting direction is actually slightly angled. So I can get the same cut. So if I cut, whether I cut, at 90 degree at 9 o'clock like this or whether I cut at 10 o'clock like this it's the same it's the same exact cut um, so that's what I usually do that that's why usually you'll see me start fairly high coming in on the cut but the other thing to notice as I get as I get closer to the center I tend to be higher up on the cut so I'm actually cutting more like 11 o'clock so I need to actually have my tool handle even higher to get the same angle. So here, right here, near the end, my cutting direction is actually right there. So if you follow, so out here, my cutting direction is here. But as I get closer in, the, the, the diameter of the cutting ring gets smaller. So it's effectively cutting up at a higher angle uh, at, at 11 o'clock. So my cutting angle, my cutting direction is actually uh, much higher. And you can see, if you watch throughout this cut, Pay attention to where the cutting, that ring that's cutting, what direction that is making with my tip of my gouge. So right now, it's about 90 degrees. So my cutting direction is coming down right here and my cool gouge is about 
perpendicular to that. But as I come in closer, you see I have to raise the tool handle. Now I'm actually cutting about about 11 o'clock. So my, tool, my cutting direction is right here, and I'm still perpendicular even though I've raised the tool handle. All I've done is trying to compensate for the fact that the diameter of my cutting ring is getting smaller. And finally, as you get towards the center, I'm cutting almost at 12 o'clock at this point. Oops, my pencil. <clears throat> I'm cutting almost at 12 o'clock now. But because my cutting action, my cutting direction is almost right there. It's almost horizontal at this point. So that's why you see it looks like the cut is changing. But actually, all I'm really doing is I'm raising my tool handle to compensate for where on the clock that I'm actually cutting. Once again, if you, walk, if you look at the angle that that cutting ring is making with my tool, it's always staying about the same. So if that's the only thing that's a little bit more difficult when you're doing a, a face work, a side grid and a face work, uh, and spindle work. Other than that, it's exactly the same cut. Now that's the cut I use pretty much when I'm cutting uh, face, side grain uh, in face work, in fact, in spindle work as well. Um, uh, but uh, there's more because it turns out that face work also, or the side grain actually scrapes really well, and especially when you're doing face work. Unlike with double rubbing cuts, where that subtlety and grain orientation in side grain doesn't make a difference. It does seem to matter when you're scraping um, because if I'm scraping with the grain with the cutting edge of the scraper, with the, with the edge of the scraper perpendicular it tends to rip the fibers a little bit more when they're perpendicular like this but because I'm cutting most of the time when I'm cutting when I'm scraping side grain I'm actually cutting only for a very moment am I cutting exactly parallel to the cutting edge. Most of the time I'm cutting, I'm shearing across the fibers, whether that little bit of, of long grain in here or uh, half part way in between, I tend to be slicing across the fibers diagonally. So it turns out that this side grain and face grain, the face work, uh, scrapes really nicely with any kind of scraping pretty much. So we can take a look at a few different ways to scrape this. Uh, the first is just to use the wing of the gouge. Uh, in fact, that's why I usually uh, use an asymmetric grind on my shallow gouges. I bring the left wing back a little bit further, it's specifically um, to be able to scrape. And what I like to do is use my pinch the, the, the tool and use my uh, finger as a guide to get a nice straight, well, that my tool rest is straight. And I, what I want is I want the wing of the gouge to be right here where I'm going to be scraping. I want that flute to be horizontal, just like that. And it looks kind of like this. Pretty good surface. One you could probably sand, start sanding this with about 120 grit. I mean, no, excuse me, maybe a 240 grit. <coughs> well, you may be wondering why it's okay. Uh, I have the same situation as I had when I tried to cut with my open flute. I'm cutting with the side, uh, the wing, and I'm uh, supporting the tool uh, over way over here. So 
I'm supporting the tool, the tool rest here, but I'm cutting away out here. So why can't I get away with it? Why could I get, couldn't I get away with it here, but I can get away with it when I'm scraping? Well, it has to do with that perimeter of the clock again. Whereas when I'm going from 12 to 9 o'clock, this cutting edge, uh, as it gets rolled over, goes into the work. But if I'm at 9 o'clock to 6 o'clock, when the work's trying to push the tool over, it's actually going away from the work. So any kind of force that overcomes my holding the tool is actually going to disengage the uh, tool from the work. So I can get away with that kind of a scrape. That's why you can scrape with the wing, but you can't cut with the wing with an open flute. Now it turns out other scraping tools also work really well. In fact, conventional scraping always ends up, almost always gives you nice results. Um, with, with uh, side green when you're working on face work. So, as always, with a conventional scraper, you want to be going downhill. And again, I like to use my finger. Uh, if I'm making straight cuts, I like to use my finger as a guide. So. You can see those nice shavings just coming right off the edge of the tool. even getting some of these nice curly shavings even from a scraping tool. That's because most of the time we're actually cutting, we're, we're actually uh, scraping, cutting um, diagonally across the fibers. You can see that left a really nice finish. There you can still see some tool marks there, but those will sand out quite easily. If you like shear scraping, the shear scraping uh, is when you take a regular conventional scraper and you turn it up on end. But on a, just like uh, um, you have to be careful, you always want to make sure you're only using the bottom half of the edge. Otherwise, uh, you'll get a catch that um, the unsupported edge right here, if it, if it engages the wood, is going to want to come back down. So usually about a 45 degrees, maybe a little bit steeper. and. And that also leaves a nice cut, a little bit less tool marks even on this side. Um, shoe scraping might be a little bit of an advanced technique, but I still want to show, uh, I don't know if, if you haven't done it before, I might want to check out how to do it properly. Um, but I want to show it here for completeness to show that uh, all kinds, all, all manner of scraping uh, well on, on side drain. And finally, my favorite uh, is a negative rake scraper. Uh, when you, it looks like a skew, but it's got a bird turned up on one side. That also does a nice job uh, on side green. And that almost looks like it needs no sanding at this point. Let's get a nice picture of this. So that's pretty much all there is to dealing with uh, side grain when you're doing face work. Uh, not a whole lot to it, a lot easier than dealing with uh, cutting across end grain. Um, same cuts that work well on spindle turning uh, work well here. And on top of that, we saw that uh, face grain, side grain and face work uh, scrapes uh, well, almost, it, it'll vary from species to species uh, which tech, scraping technique, uh, some will work better than others, um, but they all work pretty good uh, usually when you're cutting, when you're dealing with uh, side grain uh, in face work. Now, where to go from here? Uh, it turns out that these two cuts, the one for cutting across end grain and planing, I, I don't know if that's the proper term, but that planing cut with, uh, with the gouge across side grain, those are the two cuts I use pretty much everywhere, whether I'm uh, turning beads on spindle turning or, uh, or on face work or making the inside and outside of the bowl. It all comes down to those two cuts, cutting across end grain and then planing against side grain, and everything else is just the transition in between. So maybe next time we can start looking at 
uh, that sort of thing. Maybe look at sort of uh, hollowing out how hollowing out the inside of the bowl is just a matter of starting with one cut and then transitioning to the other at the bottom of the bowl, or uh, the same thing with coves and beads. So uh, it's something to think about. Until next time, uh, maybe you'll figure it out before we get there. Uh, so until next time, I'm Brian Havens, and thanks for watching.